So I said this to the Lord. I said, Lord, what is it? He said, I want you to begin to pull the family together. He said, I am pulling the family together in the United States of America. And I said, I know family, individual houses. And he said, no, I'm talking about the family of God. I'm bringing the family of God together. But the way that I do it is that I start in the house. I start in the home. And then this is what he gave me. How many of you ready? Shout yes. Okay, I'm going to talk to you just for a little bit this morning. So I want you to do something with me right now. I want you to lift your hands, your hearts, and your voices. God, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth that you will guide us and direct us into truth. I pray that the word of God will be lodged within our spirit. And from the word of the Lord being planted in our spirit, I pray it grows and blooms and blossoms into our heart, into our minds. I pray that we receive the mind of Christ. I pray that we walk in the characteristics and mannerisms of Christ. I pray that we become Jesus-centered like never before. Everybody say in Jesus' name. Say amen. Amen. So now listen, I started getting my strength back. So as I started getting my strength back, man, the Lord really began to deal with me. And I was trying to set up. Thank you. You guys can go down. I'm sorry. Um, I started getting my strength back. And the Lord began to deal with me, and he began to deal with me about what I'm going to speak to you about this morning. So turn to the one next to you and say, open your ears. Mark chapter 1, verse 21. Mark chapter 1, verse 21. Everybody say the Word of God. How how many of you need the Word of God on a daily basis? Shout yes. The Word of God. Mark chapter 1, verse 21. Starting at verse 21, this is what it says. Jesus and his disciples went into Capernaum. And immediately on the Sabbath, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. So Jesus and his disciples, and I'm, gonna, I'm just going to kind of paraphrase some things. Jesus and his disciples went into Capernaum. The center of Jesus' ministry in Galilee was Capernaum. Everybody say the center of ministry. He went into the synagogue. He began to teach the people, and the people were amazed at Jesus' teaching. All of a sudden, there was a demon in a man that began to cry out, and Jesus cast a demon out of a man, and the people were amazed with the authority and power that Jesus walked in. The news about Jesus began to spread throughout the whole region. Then it says in verse 29 of Mark chapter 1, it says, And immediately they left the synagogue, Jesus and the disciples, now watch this, and they entered into Simon Peter's house, accompanied by Andrew, James, and John. Everybody say, Jesus. Come on, say it with me. Say, Jesus entered into the house. I looked at that and I thought, okay, Lord, what are you saying here? And this is what he was saying. Jesus and his disciples left the synagogue and they entered into the house of Simon Peter along with Andrew, James, and John. Verse 30. It says, Now Simon Peter's mother-in-law was lying sick in bed with a high fever, and immediately these men, Peter, James, John, they immediately told Jesus about her. Jesus went to her, took her by the hand, raised her up, and the fever immediately left her, and she began to serve them. Now when evening came after the sun had set and the Sabbath day had ended, in a steady stream, listen to this, they were bringing to Jesus all who were sick and those who were diseased and those who were under the power of demons until the whole city had gathered at the door of Simon Peter. Okay, stay with me. Jesus entered the house. Everybody say this word with me. Say entered. To go into, to go in and through the house. It was also a place, this house was a place of time. It was a place of purpose. Jesus entered into the house with an intent. There was a purpose in Jesus. The house is the implication of a home, a household or a family. When you study the word house, it goes to the word home. From the word home, it goes to the intent of the home, which is a family. 
Watch this now. So as we look closely at the word house, he entered into the house. The word house represents a home. A home is a place that has been designed to raise a family. Jesus didn't just enter or step into the structure called the house. He stepped into a family. He stepped into the lives of those that made up the family. He had a purpose to fulfill in that family. Jesus was in the house and immediately Peter, Andrew, James, and John, they told Jesus about Peter's mother-in-law who was sick with fever. Verse 31, Jesus took the woman by the hand, raised her up, the fever left, and she began to serve them. But now watch this. I want you to look at this. Jesus had to get into the house... He entered into that house, went through the house, but he had a purpose and he had an intent to be there. What he really did is that he stepped into a family. He stepped into the life of a mother and a father. He stepped into the life of a mother-in-law. How many of you with me so far say yes? I'm going to say something to you. When revival comes to the United States of America, it's going to start in the home. Listen, in the home, watch. And it's not a legalistic thing, it's a love thing. Watch. How many of you listening to me shout yes? Jesus had a purpose to fulfill in that family. Jesus was in the house and immediately Peter, Andrew, James, and John told Jesus about Peter's mother-in-law. They didn't say, come over here and sit down at the table and let's have something to eat. Immediately, they took Jesus to the need. Immediately, they took Jesus to an individual who was sick, possibly diseased. Immediately, they took him to a problem in their, come on, say it, in in the family. In the Sumner family, we've had some problems, but we stuck together. Because our theme for a long time was, we fight hard, but we love hard. That was in the past. We love. That's it. We love. How many of you hear what I'm saying? We are a family that we are going to love. We're going to love each other, listen to me now, in sickness and in health. For richer or poorer. Somebody said, why are you saying that? Because the family was born out of a covenant where a man and a woman gave themselves to each other and said, we're not going to leave you. And that is a generational thing. It is a generational vow that is passed down from generation to generation to generation. You know what we're going to do? We're going to love no matter what. In this house, Diana, we are going to love no matter what. What? Jose, in this house, no matter what, we, we are going to condition ourselves through the Word of God that we are going to love no matter what. Now, in that love, there are certain things. We're going to stand for truth. How many of you are what we're saying? Say yes. We're going to stand for truth. We're not going to accept everything, but we're going to accept everybody. There are certain things that the Word of God teaches through the manifestation of love that some people aren't crazy about, especially when you're living in the drama of it. How many of you heard how I just said that? Listen. The family. Watch. So, the the whole town shows up at Peter's front door. The whole town. The The whole town had never showed up to Peter's house before. Why is the whole town now standing at Peter's front door, bringing the disease, bringing the sick? It had never happened before. Somebody tell me why the whole city shows up at Peter's front door. Because Jesus entered the house and began to minister to family. Now watch. Watch this. 
Jesus was in the house, the home. Miracles were taking place in the family. The word got out about what was happening at Peter's house, and the whole city shows up at Peter's front door. They were bringing the sick to Peter's house, those that were diseased and possessed, until the whole city had gathered at the door of Peter's house. Everybody say this with me loud and clear. Shout the house, the home, the family. Remember the man, remember the man that was, that was traveling on his way from Jericho to Jerusalem or vice versa? I can't remember uh, correctly. It's just coming to me right now. And all of a sudden he was overcome by robbers. And the Bible says that they stripped this man of his clothing, robbed from him, took the valuables that he had, wounded him and leaving him half dead. The Bible says that there was a certain priest that came by that situation and he looked and he saw that the man had been stripped, had been robbed and had been wounded and this certain priest just walked by. Then it says that a Levite come by that way who is also a certain priest that worked in uh, 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 the uh, sacrifices of the Lord to from the Lord to the people, from the people to the Lord. And this certain Levite came by, and he saw that the man had been stripped of his clothing, lying there naked, that he had been wounded. And listen, the Bible says he was left half dead. The man was dying. And it says that that certain priest, that certain religious man just passed by. These two priests that represents God and represents the people, and it's supposed to be bringing the hand of God and the hand of the people together, they just walk by. But the Bible says a certain Samaritan. Now we know what Jews thought about Samaritans, that Jews basically thought Samaritans were half-breeds in the scum of the earth. But the Bible says but a certain Samaritan walked by where this man was naked, wounded, and left to die, And this certain Samaritan went over there, now watch this, and stepped into his life. He entered into this man's life who had been wounded and left to die. He had been robbed. This is what it says. It says, the man poured in oil and wine, bandaged up his wounds, put the man on his own donkey, took him to a hotel, stayed up with him throughout the whole night, ministered to him throughout the whole night, And then he went to the innkeeper and said, now i got to leave. But when I come back, if he stays here for two or three weeks, I'm going to pay the bill. But this man stepped into this individual's life. He stepped into his house. Who knows, this man that had been robbed and left to die possibly was a father, possibly no doubt a brother, had a sister or a brother. Someone had, so he affected a family. Every time you minister to somebody through the handwork of God and the anointing of God, you're not just ministering to an individual, you're ministering to a family. They're connected to a family. They were birthed through a, how many of you hear what I'm saying? In this house we have a covenant. To love and to cherish until death do us part. Said, sounds like we're married. No, listen to me. My mom and dad came together, Betty and Clifford Sumner, who are now in heaven. They came together, but they made vows. When Kathy and I come together, we, we took a vow to love and to cherish until death do us part. Somebody said, yeah, but that's it. No, no, no. And everything we give birth to, it's a generational vow. And it has been attacked. Listen to me. Watch now. Jesus stepped into the house. It doesn't mean he just stepped into a structure. He stepped into people's lives. My sons are here along with their wives, along with our grandchildren. I've been perfect as a father, right? (laughs) You've been perfect as sons, right? Can I say something to you? Can we love outside of perfection.
Man, my strength was gone. I couldn't get up and come to the office and do what I do. But I laid there and, and, and listened. Jerry, I would think. And let me, I'm not saying this to build myself up because I don't like pride, prestige, or ego, man. I, 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 I don't like those three triplets. I don't like them. But I sat here and I would think, and you know, no exaggeration, I, I would think about Tammy, Finley, and Donald. Not only would I think about you, but I would see your faces, and it's because we're family. We're part of each other, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. How many of you hear what I'm saying? See, I don't know if we really understand the covenant of stepping into Jesus and staying engrafted in Him and Him coming into us because the same things that are in Jesus, if you stay in the vine, come into you and I. And we, listen, the same things that are in Him are in us. See, I think the transformation is more as I'm saved, I'm more than I'm just saved and going to heaven. I think the transformation is I begin to think like Jesus. How many of you hear what I'm saying? Come on. So, we, it, listen, if you get blessed, somebody came to me the other day and said, can you believe that I just got an $8 an hour raise? And I thought, hot stinking dog. Everybody say it with me. Say hot stinking dog. Yeah, that, that's a good saying. You'll use that tomorrow. I got all excited about an an $8 an hour raise in this day and age. Man, I got excited. When people get new cars, I get excited. When people move into new houses, man, I get excited. I mean, they don't get excited when the bill comes in, but I mean, I get excited for them. Do you get excited about other people, or are you only excited about what happens in your circle? Wait a minute. Family? You're my sister. You come out of that Italian bloodline. You are a stem winder. But if you say you're going to get something done, you get it done. I know that about Deanna Mae. I know it. I look around this morning, and I want to tell you folks something. Get ready for abundance. Get ready for increase. Get ready for a super abundant abounding supply because, Heather, it's coming. There is something that is coming to this house because I want to tell you why. Because we've stood faithful. We've dug our heels in. We have not compromised. Hear, how many of you hear what I'm saying? Now watch this. Somebody said, yeah, but you don't know what people are saying. Yeah, and I don't want to know what they're saying. Because I don't want to lose my focus on what God's saying. The problem is, so many times we get spiritual glaucoma because we listen to what everybody else is saying to us instead of listening to what God's saying for us. If you're with me, shall Yes. Watch now. So we look closely at the word house. He entered into the house. The word house represents a home. A home is a place that has been designed to raise a family. Family, that which has been designed by God. He had a purpose to fulfill in that family, and he fulfilled that purpose. But after he fulfilled the purpose of the family, the family became a testimony. The house of Peter became a testimony. And people were gathered around the house because Jesus was manifesting himself in Peter's home. But it was, everybody say, Jesus entered the house. The word got out that what was happening at Peter's house, the house, the home, the family. What is family? What is family? It is a design of God for a man and a woman who come together in covenant and reproduce, raising up daughters and sons, grandsons, granddaughters, uncles, aunts, nephews, nieces, grandmothers, grandfathers. It's talking about generations. I can talk to you about certain groups of people that have planned for the next generation, not just planned for their own generation. They have not planned for their own success. They have planned for five generations ahead of them. We've got to start looking at generations. Instead of individuality. If you're with me, shout yes. God is coming to restore the family back to health. I'm telling you. That's why next week we're going to have a Thanksgiving family dinner. We're going to have a few songs, a few courses. I'm going to say some things about Thanksgiving. And then we are going to have cornania together. 
we are going to sit down and eat something. He said, well, I don't want to do that. That, okay, there you go. Well, I know what she said about me two or three years. <laughs> there you go. See? See, who entered your house? Who got in your house? Who took over your house? Who got you to walk away from the covenant? Who got you to slander? Who got you to criticize? Who's in your house? Whoo, hot dog. No, I didn't say that. Watch. Now watch. How many of you with me say yes? Everybody say generations. We as the family of God are to reproduce, we are, sub- are to subdue, and we are to take dominion. We are to be fruitful and multiply and replenish. God has put it under our power to take dominion and do these things. Everybody shout family. God spoke to Adam and Eve these things. He spoke to a family. He spoke to a unit. He spoke to what He had designed. And if we're not careful, we take, we take away what God has purposed for us. Look at me, man. It hasn't been easy being a daddy. It hasn't been easy. There's been great victories, there's been great successes, but it's not easy being a father. It's not easy being a mama, a mother, a nana. How many of you with me so far say yes? Now, we're going to take a strange turn here. It's going to be a strange turn, so hang on with me. Because I want to tell you something, Lewis family. God has something designed for your house, for your home for your family and the enemy has tried to trip things up but I'm telling you right now through and by the power of the Holy Spirit when I was laying on my back I saw those girls and I saw them singing you hear me I saw them singing and it wasn't singing before people they were singing in the house they were singing in the home the Lord began to deal with me and He began to say to me about, about your children that they know, they know the true power of God and they know conviction and they know the difference between conviction and condemnation. But the Lord is calling them even in the midst of the storm and even in the midst of threats. Does that make sense? Listen to me. family we were talking about family last night we were talking about my dad my dad Clifford James Sumner he was about this tall coal black hair little beady black eyes and man if you didn't do it his way you didn't do it at all You'd be working with him on a car and you could be taking out the spark plugs and start on the right side of the engine and he'd say, why don't you take them out on the left first? Okay, Dad, I'll take them out on the left. Whatever you want me to do, Dad, we'll do it your way. My dad was illiterate. He could not read or write and this is what he would say. We'd be putting something together and he'd say, read the directions to me and I'd read the directions to him and he said, that ain't what it says. (laughs) And I'd look at him and say, Dad, you don't know how to read. He said, and he'd say things like, that's what it says, that's what it says. And he'd say, well, let, let's see if it'll work like this. You know what I want to be? And that, I'm not coming against my father. My father was cool, calm. He was good. To, he, was, he was great. I want to be the type of person that I want to do it. I'm going to say this. If there's an easy way to do it, I want to do it. How many of you with me? Lift your hands. And I found out that my way is usually not the easy way to do it. It might be easy at the beginning, but a lot of times what the things that I have instituted in my life comes with certain consequences because of the way that it was done. Did I just make sense? Everybody say God's way. Say this, say God's way for generations to come. Okay, now watch, we're going to take a strange turn here now. And we're going to go to Luke chapter 11, verse 1. It says, and it came to pass as Jesus was praying in a certain place, after he finished praying, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, Master, 
teach us to pray just as John also taught his disciples. And he said to them, he said, when you pray, say, watch this now. He said, when you pray, say, he didn't say, say, my father, which art in heaven. He said, when you pray, teaching them, he said, pray, our father. Everybody say it with me, say, our father. Jesus didn't say, say, my father. He said, say, our father. Now watch this. Already bringing the disciples into the family mentality, into the brotherhood, into sonship. He said, say our Father. He didn't say, say my. He was already giving them a vision of brotherhood and family. He was saying, say our Father. Everybody say it with me. Say our Father. Now listen. The family of God. We call Him Father. Head of the family. Ephesians chapter 2. Now here we go. Ephesians chapter 2. How many of you still with me? Say yes. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 18 through 22. I want to read it to you. For it is through Jesus Christ that we both have a direct way of approach in one spirit to the Father. So when you are no, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens. Say we are not strangers. Say, we are not aliens. Now, I want you to say this. Say, we are not outsiders. When you come into Christ and Christ comes into you, you are not an outsider. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, outsiders without rights of citizenship, but you are fellow citizens with the saints, God's people, and are members, now listen to this, and are members of God's household, simply meaning we are members of God's family. Everybody say, God's family. Through Christ. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus Himself as the chief cornerstone, and whom the whole structure is... What structure? What structure is He talking about? Family. God's family. God's household. The church. Watch. Whom the whole structure is joined together, and it continues to increase... Growing into a holy temple in the Lord, a sanctuary dedicated, set apart, and sacred to the presence of the Lord. Now watch this. In Him and in fellowship with one another. Look. You also are being built together. Now here it is. You also are being built together. Everybody say together. Say as one. We are being built together as one into a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Listen. A family. The household of God. When it talks about the household of God, it's talking about belonging to the title. You belong to the title, one who owns the house. Or the head of the family. Belonging to one's household means You are related by blood. Listen to me. Kindred. Everybody say the blood of Jesus. Come on, talk to me now. Say the blood of Jesus brings us all together. We are related. We can become brothers and sisters. He sets up a government. He sets up an order. How many of you with me say yes? Family. But we so easily walk away from each other. Sometimes. It's hard for me to understand how we walk away from each other so easily. Russ Taft used to sing a song that says, You're my brother, you're my sister, so take me by the hand. Together it will work till he comes. There's no foe that can defeat us when we're walking side by side. As long as there is love, we will stand. Listen. Watch this. If you're with me, say yeah. How many of us create our own thing and try to get God's approval on it? He said Jesus was the head. I think the thing today is that there's so many different avenues. But even with all the different attitudes, I've come to the conclusion of this. I am not arguing. How many of you have ever been to a family event and it breaks out into a family brawl? Buddy, growing up, 
we used to have celebrations and everything could be great and then all of a sudden it'd break out. We'd go home. What about family? Will you allow the Lord to bring restoration and reconciliation to your family? Not only your family in the physical, those that you have come together in a covenant and you have given birth to, will you allow God to minister to your family and then will you allow God to minister to His family? How many of you hear what I'm saying? Say yes. The household of God. Galatians chapter 6, verse 10 talks about the household of faith, the family of God, household, the conviction. Listen to what it means. The conviction that God exists and God is the creator and ruler of all things and He has made possible for us eternal salvation through His Son, Jesus Christ. You and I have been born again into this body, this family. There is a fidelity. Everybody say fidelity. No, no, every, come on. There is a fidelity. A faithfulness, a loyalty in the family of God. The Father established it. We must become people that can be relied on just like we rely on our Father. Watch this now. We are of God's household. The church is a family. I absolutely love the story of the children of Israel as they are walking around the walls of Jerusalem. And I'm closing. Are they walking around the walls of Jericho? I absolutely love it. They walk around the walls. The walls come crashing down. Okay, that's great. But the thing that I love about the story about walking around the walls of Jerusalem is not that the walls come crashing down. It's that there was a woman whose house was built into the wall by the name of Rahab. Everybody say that with me. Say Rahab. Everybody turn to your neighbor and say, get in the house. Get in the house that God built. How many of you hear what I'm saying? Get in the house that God built. Now watch this. I absolutely love the story, but my most favorite part of the story is the salvation of those that got in the house of Rahab. Now I want to read something to you, and then I'm going to close. And I want you, I want you, to, I want you to look right here, okay? Because this word is an important word, and I don't want you to be distracted. Stay with me. Joshua chapter 2. Joshua chapter 2, verses 12 through 15. Listen to what it says. So they sent out two spies. Joshua sent out two spies to spy out the land. And these two spies come to... Rahab. And Rahab and these spies get into a conversation. And this is what she says. She says, and now, verse 12 of Joshua chapter 2 says this, and now please swear an oath to me by the Lord since I have shown you kindness and I have hid you. You will also show kindness. Listen to what she says to my father's household, to my father's family, and give me a pledge of truth and faithfulness and spare my father and my mother and my brothers and my sisters along with everyone who belongs to them and let us all live. I hid you because I believe in your God. I'm telling you I believe in your God and I believe in His plan and I hid you and because I have hid you, will you please show me favor and save my father, my mother, my brothers, my sister, along with everyone who belongs to them and let us live. So the spies said to her, the men said to her, listen what they say, our lives for yours. Boy, that's strong. Our lives for yours. If you do not tell anyone about this business of ours, then when the Lord gives us the land, we will show you kindness and faithfulness and keep our agreement with you. Then she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was built into the city wall so that she was living on the wall. 
Then she told them, she said, go west to the hill country so the pursuers have headed east. So she sent them in the opposite direction. She was guarding the men of God. How many of you with me say yes? The men said to her, we shall be blameless and free from this oath which you have made and you swear to us. Unless when we come into the land, you tie this cord of scarlet thread to the window through which you let us down and bring us into the house. Your father, listen to what they say to her, your father and your mother, your brothers and all your father's household so that they will be saved. Listen to this. Verse 21. She said, According to your words, so be it. Then Rahab sent them off and they departed and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. Because when the children of Israel came to march around the walls of Jericho, when the walls fell down flat, her house was the only one that stood. How many of you with me say yes? Now watch this. Just stay with me for a moment because it has to do with your family. It has to do with this family. Have you lost a daughter? Have you lost a son? No, no, no. I don't mean that they have passed on. And if they have passed on, man, my heart goes out. I'm talking about have you lost them to the culture? To what society has developed and released into the culture? Listen. Joshua chapter 2, or Joshua chapter 6, I'm sorry. Joshua chapter 6, verse 8. Listen, and they walk on around the walls of the city, and it says, And the city shall be accursed, even it and all that are therein to the Lord. Everything in the city and all that are therein shall be cursed to the Lord. Listen what, jo- listen what Joshua says. This is verse 17. Of Joshua 6. Only Rahab. Listen. Now. He really described. Only Rahab the harlot. Shall live. She and all that are with her in her house. Turn the one next to you and say get in the house. And the reason she shall be saved, because she hid the messengers that we sent. Now stay with me. Verse 23 says, And the young men that were spies went in and brought out Rahab. They brought out her father and her mother and her brothers and all her, and all, uh, uh, out, all of her kindred and left them and led them without the camp of Israel. Now listen. Rahab submitted in faith to God's program. Rahab submitted in faith to God's program. As a result, she came under the covering of Israel and her family did too. With a cord of scarlet thread, a rope of scarlet thread, she marked her home. Everybody say, her home was marked. I want to ask you a question. Is your home marked with the presence of God? When people walk in, you know what I noticed about my family yesterday? I don't know if you guys noticed or not, but Roger and Glenda and Darla and Bill and, and, and Kylie and, and Ryan, and they didn't want to leave. It seemed to me like they didn't want, it seemed like there was a link. They didn't want to leave. Can I tell you what? I didn't want them to leave. I hugged my sister three times. Somebody said, is that not normal? No, we're a hugging bunch. You know what I like about love? It's when it's real. You ever been loved by counterfeit love? Can I, only what you can get. Listen to me. Can I say something to you right now? Everybody, let's confess us together. Say, no counterfeit love here. Come on, shout, no counterfeit love here. See, I remember, Bob and Phoebe, this is what I thought about too. I thought about your family. I thought about your family, in those, but I thought about Psalm 126. Remember that? I'm telling you the word of the Lord went out forth over you and your family and said that Psalm 126 was going to come to pass. Remember that? And, and in that psalm, in one version, it says, you have to pinch me so I will know that this is not just a dream.
family. Watch now. When she tied that scarlet robe outside of her house, it was a sign. It was a rope. It was a sign of salvation, of deliverance. It was a sign of faith. You know what it really was when you studied it out? It was a symbol of the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus, say this with me, say Jesus is in this house. Jesus is in this home. Jesus is in this family. Say, in my house, in my home, where my family has been designed. Say, Jesus lives there. When people come to your home, do they know Jesus lives there? I'm going to read two more scriptures, then I'll be done. This is to this body today. You know what, Nick? I want to tell you what I like about you. You fit. You're cool, calm, collected, Nick, and not many people might not know you, but you've been coming here now for several months, and if they don't know you, then they missed a blessing. Nick knows a lot about some things. He knows some things about farming. Boy, I love that. He knows some things about diesel trucks. I love to sit and listen to him talk, if you can get him to talk. But you're part of the family. You sense that, don't you? Being a part. Listen, there's parts of this family. There's a woman in this house that she is one of the greatest writers I've ever seen in my life. And I went by here this morning and I told her this morning, I said, do you realize how valuable you are? I said, you're very, very quiet. But if you knew this woman and you confided in her, I guarantee you what you confided in her, she would never say a word about it. But boy, she sets and she writes. And some of her writings go very, very deep. I told her, I said, start putting it in chapters because we're going to put it in a book. Listen. Why? Because that's what family does. We encourage each other to go forward in our strengths. How many of you hear what I'm saying? Say yes. To go forward in our giftings and in our talents. Matthew chapter 12. I'm going to read this. Am I boring you? I don't, I don't want to bore you. Family. Matthew chapter 12, verse 46. It says, While Jesus yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood outside desiring to speak with him. Then one said unto Jesus, Behold, Jesus, your mother and your brethren stand outside desiring to speak to you. But Jesus replied to the one who told him, this is what Jesus said. Jesus said, who is my mother? And who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand towards his disciples and all of his other followers, he said, here is my mother and my brothers. For Listen to this. For whosoever does the will of my Father who is in heaven, by believing in me and following me, is my brother and my sister and my mother is part of my family. Now listen, let's let's cut through all the chase when it comes to the will of God. Let me tell you the will of God for your life. The will of God for your life is believing in Jesus and following Him. How many of you heard what I just said? Shout yes. Believing in Jesus and following His Word. Listen. Let's look at Joshua chapter 24. And like I said, I'm closing. Joshua 24. This is what it says. So it's at the end of Joshua. At the end of the book of Joshua. And Joshua is talking Uh, a lot about about the people of Israel. And it's talking about certain situations that they have faced. And then, then he says this. The people answered and said to Joshua, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God, He it is that brought us up and our fathers out of the land of Egypt. You see that? 
from the house of bondage. And He did great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way wherein we went. But I love the verse before the children of Israel say, we will not forsake the Lord and we will not turn and serve other gods. This is what Joshua set before them. He said, if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, listen at this, choose for yourselves this day who you will serve. Whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live. Then Joshua said this, As for me and my house, as for me and my family, as for me and my sons and daughters, and as for me and generations to come, we choose to serve the Lord. I'd like for everyone to stand your feet this morning if you would. I'm going to say something very strong right now, okay? And please... Don't take this in a negative. There's been a lot of moving around this morning. But I'm going to tell you something. I don't want you to hear this. And please don't take an offense to it. What do, what, how a man and a woman come together and they produce what to create a family? Children. I think it's time for us in this house to start pouring into our children like we have never poured into our children before. It's time for us to start being concerned about generations more than just our own. I got two grandsons. Listen, you don't have to take her out. You let them stay right here. That's the sound I want to hear. I'm telling you right now, that is perfect for this time and for this climate in this house. Let me hear the voices of the little children. Let me walk into a classroom where they're being developed and not babysit. Let me walk into a church where we're more concerned about the generations to come because we have already facilitated ourselves in the Word of God and what we know and we believe in Jesus and we're just going to follow Him. I looked this morning. I got a picture of little Emma. I got a picture of Emma and Ollie and Mary. But I got a picture of Emma when she was born. Now she's up here on this platform singing. You telling me that that girl doesn't face a warfare? You telling me how many of you have fought a warfare because you were advancing in the kingdom and you were doing what God was telling you to do? But I want to say something to you. There's been some statements made by our culture concerning our children. And I say, God forbid. October 28, 1959, I was born into the Sumner family, and it was not, I had no choice. I had no choice. I'm going to say what Paul said. I'm probably the biggest sinner amongst you. But he went and he never left you alone. He pulled you out and he brought you back in. And I'm telling you right now, there is profitable, productive ministry in you. There is unction and utterance in you. You have a love and a compassion for people. I saw it last Sunday when you stepped on the grounds. It was like you were saying, I'm here. I finally got here. If I'm wrong, you tell me I'm wrong. And I got to get in covenant. Immediately, I talked to Robert and I introduced him to Randy. I went over and I'm sorry, Bonnie, I'm going to call you Barbara for the rest of your life. 
But I went to Barbara and I said, where's Robert? And she said, some guy come over here and got him and took him off and got him signing up for all this stuff. Can I tell you men something on the 17th? On the 17th, we are going to have a night meeting with word, worship, and fellowship. And I want to speak to the men of this house about the advancement of a father. A man that produces a seed that impregnates a womb as a man and a woman comes together and all of a sudden, I watch, man, I watched you and Aaron. I watched you. As you come together as husband and wife, I watched you. As you begin to give birth to them babies, Violet, she's the newest one. Everybody say Violet. God, she's a doll. I watched the changes in Aaron's life as Aaron became, went from a man, went from a boy to being a man. I watched you as you went through certain cycles in life and situations in life. I thought about it this week. I watched it now that you have a family of three. By Lord, are you guys going to have any more? Listen, the Lewis family got nine. She said, nada. <laughs> I remember Raul and Carmen. Raul and Carmen had nine children, right? Had nine children, and Raul come up to me, and we was preaching a meeting, and he came up to me, and he said, Pastor, I said, Brother Tim? I said, yes, sir. He said, I think it's time me and Carmen get married. Look, Kayla. But I want to tell you something. I'm decreeing and declaring over your family. They're coming. They're coming in. Sons and daughters. Grandsons and granddaughters. Great, great grandsons and granddaughters. Generation after generation. The name of Jesus is not going to leave our house. The blood of Jesus is not going to leave our house. Salvation, deliverance, and healing, restoration, and reconciliation through the love of God is not leaving the house. I walked up to Angel and Faith this morning. I looked you square on the eyeball, did I not? And I said, let's do this thing. And you know what she said to me? She looked at me and she said, let's do it. Have you ever been a mother that's had a broken heart? Have you ever been a father that's had a broken heart? Have you ever had been a son that's had a broken heart? I've been a father that my heart's been broken. I've been a son that my heart's been broken. Had to walk through some deep waters. Had to go. But all of us has been through stuff, right? Come on. I was made fun of when I was growing up. I was a short, little, chunky guy. And they'd make fun of me and call me names. And if I could have caught them, I'd have probably torn them to pieces. But they could outrun me. They'd call me names. You know what, man, for a couple of years, they were prejudiced against me. I can remember I'd keep my shirt pulled down, and I'd, try to, I'd tell my mom, if we get these certain pants from Kmart, I can pull them up high. You know what I was trying to do? One day I went home, and I was mad. My dad looked at me, and he said, what's wrong with you? And I said, look at me. I was in the seventh grade, I think it was. I said, look at me. He said, you want to make some changes? I said, yeah, I want to make some changes. He went, he, we shopped at Kmart. He went to Kmart and bought me 110 pounds of cement-filled weights. I found an old bench press, and I started working out every day, six days a week. I can't tell you how many... I went from weighing like a hundred and, I don't know, 50-something pounds, little kind of short guy. All of a sudden, my body started changing. But then as my body started to change, I had to deal with pride. 
Because I didn't no longer have a keg, I had a washboard. Do you all hear what I'm saying? I'm just trying to come down where we're all at. Family. Man, I want, I want my sons and my daughter, my daughter-in-laws, my grandsons, my granddaughters. I don't know if I'm supposed to say this or not, and the one on the way. I just said it. <laughs> family. Your family. It's okay that you're not standing today because we understand. Man, your body's been through it. You're precious. And you're here and you're part of us. You don't have to. See, this is where I'm at. You know what? You don't have to stand up by me. I'll come sit down by you. You hear what I'm saying? Heather. Oh, yeah. You work behind the scenes. You go ahead and you work behind the scenes. But know as you're working behind the scene, God sees it. He sees it all. You've waited for this time. You've waited for this season. Man, I'll just sit down by you. You know why? Because I love you. And I want you to feel like you're part of us. And I, you can't tell me that you weren't looking around saying, I wish. You know, I, I would like to stand up, but I'm tired. My feet hurt. Well, sit down. Not everybody. So I sit down by you. It's time for family to reach out to family. It says to even treat more nobly those of the household of faith. My name's Tim. What's your name? 